Well, I think this is enough time to welcome people. So let me welcome you. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. This is our weekly meeting where we collaboratively and through conversation explore the future of higher education. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation. We've been focusing on inclusivity throughout the forum's life, especially for the past two years. We've been in a whole series of sessions, especially looking at race and racism. Now, I'd like to welcome Rita Kumar and Brenda Raffae. They're both at the University of Cincinnati. They both have an English literature and English professor background. Rita runs their faculty enrichment center, which I think is where they physically are today. And Brenda, Professor F.A., is a professor of English who is teaching a lot on composition and writing. Together, they published a book on inclusive teaching and very recently uh, published a really handy article at Inside Higher Ed on small changes to promote inclusivity. Uh, so let me just bring them up on stage so we can start talking. Let's see how it works. And hello, professors. Hello. Hello. Good to see you both. Good to see you both. Um, you can see from the chat that we're all pretty keenly concerned about weather. So you have to tell us, how hot is it there in Cincinnati? I believe it's 94 today. Whoa. Whoa. And very humid. <laughs> oh, 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 you're pressing the wet bolt very hard. But you're you're safe and sound in air conditioning right now, right? And the, at the moment, yes. <laughs> nice stay, there, stay there as long as you can. Um, <laughs> And in, in the chat, we have people who are talking about things, temperatures in the 90s or the 100s. This is summer. We're, uh, we're getting hit hard by this. But, but it's a lot easier to bear and much more pleasant to bear with the help of wonderful scholars like yourselves. Um, we have a tradition on the forum. Uh, we, we like to ask people to introduce themselves, not by talking about their past, but by talking about their future. And if you could just say, what are you going to be working on for the next year? Uh, what kind of projects? kind of initiatives, what kind of stuff, and what kind of ideas are going to be top of mind for you for the next year? Can I start? Sure. Um, so this, you know, in the past two years, we have been really busy with our work on our book, uh, you know, in equity and inclusion and higher education strategies for teaching. And this year has been busy uh, essentially with, uh, you know, uh, promotion related to the book. However, as we look, as I look forward in my role as the executive director of the Faculty Enrichment Center, I am looking at um, more innovative pro uh, programming for our faculty here at University of Cincinnati, and how we can meet our objectives of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, career advancement, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, and personal uh, and social well-being. And uh, Brenda and I continue to work. Uh, closely uh, on several projects together um, that uh, are going to be coming up uh, in the latter half of the year, which include uh, a, a keynote address, uh, right. some workshops for our own faculty here on inclusive teaching, and uh, you know, some other work that uh, we have been thinking about but just haven't had the time or the bandwidth to just uh, address yet. And I'm going to ask Brenda to add to this. Yeah. And so as a faculty member, I'm also a member of our Coalition for Anti-Racist Action, and I've been working on a um, syllabus rubric to help faculty to decolonize the curriculum and create a more inclusive syllabus for their courses, and that work is going to continue into the future. Um, and I'm also our Learning and Teaching Center Director at the University of Cincinnati Blue Ash College, where we have a number of initiatives to um, bring in a social justice center for our college um, and some more programming around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that sounds very much continuing your, your recent work and, uh, and really taking it forward. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, this is a place for you to ask your questions and to make your comments and to float your ideas. I'm just going to start off with a couple of quick questions just to get the ball rolling. But remember, use on the bottom bottom of the screen, use that raised hand if you want to join us around the table, or uh, click the uh, Q&A box. 
want to ask her a question. And by the way, if, if you haven't had a chance yet to look at this work, you should see two uh, buttons on the bottom left of the screen, uh, one that is linked to Inside Hood Piece and one that's linked to our author's book. So you can take a look at either of those uh, as we go. Uh, my, my first question to, to ask you is, um, over the past two years, we had a, a huge cultural shift in the United States, huge mm -hmm. cultural mm -hmm. shift in the United States and higher education, really a very strong focus on racism and anti-racism. And I, I'm curious, looking at the past two years, which teaching practices in favor of inclusion have really been the most popular among the faculty that you work with and which have been the most effective? <laughs> um, so I don't know that I would say that there's any one practice that covers everybody across the board. Um, when we're doing this work around anti-racism, what seems to be most effective is to be very specifically understand your context, your student population, your disciplinary content, and to work with that information to um, decolonize the syllabus um, and the course, and then um, if I'm thinking about specific things that people have done within their courses is they have um, more broadly um, looked at equity and inclusion statements, diversity uh, and inclusion statements that they can add to their syllabus to denote to their um, students their commitment to creating an inclusive space for their students. So that's one that kind of goes across disciplines. But then as we work with individual faculty, it really is a case-by-case -case basis on how to um, address what needs to be addressed in their classes. Oh, interesting, interesting. So that statement of care, that statement of intent is, is something which can be generic in the positive sense that everyone can use that. Um, but otherwise, it's really a, I mean, it, it sounds like you're, you're doing a kind of a consulting basis uh, with individual cases. One thing that I would like to add, I think that is uh, core to, to this work is, uh, is self-awareness, self-assessment. And, uh, you know, uh, even as we, we offer uh, strategies for to our faculty, we do encourage them to begin with uh, self-awareness, uh, a process of reflection, to look within themselves and to be able to uncover their own values and their biases as they begin this work. And then to um, uh, really um, think about what will guide their work in, and what we we, we prompt them to think about is to be intentional in this work because we know um, uh, this work needs that level of intentionality and commitment. So I think, uh, again, as Brenda said, this is goes across the board, irrespective of discipline, but that's the place to start and where we, uh, it's, it can be sometimes uncomfortable, but uh, I think uh, necessary to be able to commit to, to this work long term. Very good. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, those, are, those are very, very solid answers. Um, I'm going to exhort all of you uh, to put forth your own questions. Uh, so again, uh, just use the Q&A box uh, if you'd like to type in a question that I can raise, or uh, just click the raised hand button so you can join us virtually around the table. Uh, we already have one quick question that came in from Lisa Durf, our good friend, and she asks, what exactly does decolonize the syllabus mean? All right, um, so um, a lot of our disciplines are Eurocentric. They're based in traditional practices of European Western thinking. And so to decolonize our curriculum and our syllabus is to really think beyond that. Other ways of knowing, uh, perhaps bringing in indigenous ways of knowing into the course or into the curriculum, um, thinking through other ways of knowing and making those um, ways of knowing accessible to our students. It's um, applicable to all disciplines, but it's easier to see in some disciplines than others. And that's why, as Rita said, you know, really looking at yourself, your values, and then being able to make the familiar strange so that you can start to identify those areas where you've just always assumed that the way you do something is the correct way, when there may be other ways of um, thinking or being that might help your students. Um, so to give a very concrete example, in English composition, standard edited English is like the default, everybody assumes that that is like the normal way to speak. 
but that really is representing a white middle class way of talking or communicating. And so when we use that as the normative, we are shutting down other ways of communicating with our students and um, making them feel that their own ways of speaking and communicating are not as accepted in the classroom. And so how do we build um, students' communicative abilities to add in additional ways of communicating mm -hmm. rather than saying, this is the right way, you're speaking the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lisa, uh, I, I hope that's a good question. I appreciate your directness, um, and uh, I hope that's a good answer for you. If you'd like to add more, please you know, fire up the Q&A box, and uh, we, we'd love to hear more. Thank you, uh, Brenda, for that very, very detailed and very clear answer. Rita, did you want to dive in on that? Uh, you know, I, I see that, you know, how does one, uh, to add, how does one alter a syllabus, you know, uh, or, you know, there are several ways that that can be done in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the way the syllabus is written, it should be less prescriptive and more welcoming. Uh, you, you know, just a small example where you're mentioning, um, uh, you know, about the course and uh, instead of saying this is what you will study, it could be done in ways where you invite your students to join you in the exploration of that discipline. And as Brenda said, then we are reaching out to different people and their different communicative styles uh, or talking about, um, you know, the tone of our of our uh, syllabus, the language of the syllabus and the way we, we actually design the syllabus, you know, um, we, in, in, to, to incorporate visual aspects into the syllabus that will make it easier for some of our students who may be challenged in that way to be able to, to uh, read the syllabus more effectively. And... Um, uh, make it sound less like a contract, but as an invitation for our students to participate with us in that mm -hmm. learning process. That's a great phrase, less like a contract and more like an invitation. Um, just uh, There's a question coming in, but I just want to press on one point here. Uh, Rita, what is, uh, when you mentioned um, uh, making it readable, are you speaking about accessibility in terms of, say, visual disability? Yes, accessibility as well as also accessible in terms of the tone of the language and what, you know, some terms that we, as academics, we just assume that our students know, but, uh, you know, we want to, uh, we want to be transparent. What do we really mean, you know, when we say certain things, you know, or um, providing rationale for certain aspects of our syllabus, you know, these, you will be, you know, for example, if you're talking about a policy on plagiarism, it's sort of just handing the policy of plagiarism, wow. explaining why that is important in, in, in the academic world, and then, you know, uh, giving them a, a sense of that, you know, there are ways that they will not uh, necessarily be, uh, not, not necessarily writing in a penalizing style that, you know, if you don't do this, you will be penalized, but saying, wow. this is a way to understand it, and, you know, this is important, and this is the reason for it's important. So there's, there's small ways to make that an invitation rather than a contract. Interesting. That's a, that's a great way of putting it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a previous guest who couldn't make it uh, to this um, to this session uh, because of a scheduled conflict, but he wanted to put uh, accessibility on the table uh, as well. Um, we have a, another question that came up from Robin Pappas uh, in the chat, and Robin asks, how does one check oneself about appropriating other cultures while trying to decolonize content and disciplinary approaches? How to walk that line? Yeah, I think that goes back to what Rita was saying and working with your students. And I see somebody has put in the chat that they work with their students to co-create the syllabus, which uh -huh. is one thing that we would highly recommend. I think if mm -hmm. you're going to go to, it, like I mentioned earlier, indigenous ways of knowing, then maybe you go to that community to ask them to work with you. Um, so in Alaska, um, the work there by, uh, by the authors of Stop Talking, they mm. did just that. They invited the members of that community into the um, space for faculty development and education to better understand how they could decolonize their curriculum. So I would say work with the um, people in your local community to help you to not appropriate the culture, but to actively um, integrate it into your curriculum. Well, that, uh, that's a great question, uh, by the way. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, for that. And, uh, and again, uh, Brenda, thank you for that uh, really clear answer. 
Uh, I can tell that you are practiced and you've been thinking about these very deeply for some time now uh, at, at a great level. Uh, we have a couple more questions that are coming in. I want to flash these on the screen. This is one from uh, Catherine Wilson of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, and she says, what approach has been successful for faculty groups to engage in this effort to recreate content? I, I go back to learning communities. Yeah. When people who are very interested in the topic get together, like-minded people, create a community of practice around that topic, it's really effective because then you have that cadre of people who are willing to challenge you and question what you're doing but you also feel comfortable sharing what you're doing so that um, it moves you forward. Um, so we've both been fortunate to have those opportunities in our work um, in the past, and it's something that we're trying to continue as we move forward. So within my department now in English, we have a community based around anti-racist curriculum development for composition courses that keeps us moving forward so that we don't stagnate and think, oh, I've got the inclusive course now. Um, but in, along with that anti-racist approach, we are also very keen to understand how do we make our courses accessible, it, that we have many students at our college um, who need accessibility resources support. And so we want to make sure that our courses are arranged for their needs without needing extra accommodations, but that they're already accessible to those students. Well, thank you. I, if, if, if I could ask um, Rita, just a quick question. Uh, this is so sure. fast. I, I have so many questions, but I want to make sure that I, mean, I, I have so many questions, but I want to make sure that it's one of our communities of practice form around their departments uh, or across departmental lines. Brian, can you repeat that question because there was some disturbance and I didn't quite catch the first half of your question. Sure. Um, when you're thinking about faculty communities of practice, uh, mm -hmm. do you like is it better to form them up within departmental groups or do you prefer to have them cross departmental barriers? Uh, personally, based on my own experience in faculty learning communities, I really enjoy the interdisciplinary aspect of, of the learning communities. I enjoy the opportunity to converse with people um, that were outside my department because it gave me a broader perspective of looking at things because sometimes we get so caught up in our own discipline within our and within our own department uh, that we are not unable to open our eyes to new ways of thinking. And I yeah. think when we have interdisciplinary faculty learning communities, uh, that is the advantage because you are uh, prompted to speak and discuss with people coming from other disciplines and they bring their own perspective of looking at things and I think that is a really um, a great way to enrich our own uh, you know teaching practices. Excellent thank you thank you. Um, I'm trying not to ask my questions anymore I'm just so excited about this and so fascinated. Um, thank you uh, for that uh, really really solid answer. We have um, uh, another question here from Amara Cardoza who comes to us from King University in New Jersey and Amara asks how do you manage students being late to class, quote unquote late, when time is a colonized concept? Would you still recommend deducting points or not? Um, so this is there are several ways to approach it, I think, is when we when we think about inclusivity, it does not mean necessarily that there are no rules to a class, right? And uh, you know, perhaps in, in the case of this particular student who continues to be late you may want to take some time to uh, pull the student aside and have a conversation with them to really understand what is the reason behind the student being late. Mm -hmm. And without making assumptions, oh, this person represents this culture, they tend to come, you know, what I know about this culture, they tend to have a different sense of time, um, may not necessarily be true, most of the time is not. There are individual circumstances involved in a, in a certain person's behavior, and I think it it behoves us to first uh, check in with the student, what is going on before coming to making any assumptions or coming to a conclusion. Well, I, I, that's a very, very balanced answer to uh, a very, very direct and, and, and tricky question. Uh, Amara, if you'd like to uh, follow up um, with more, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and for everybody else, again, this is, you can tell our guests are incredibly kind and answer um, 
re with really admirable seriousness. If you have any more questions or comments, uh, I'm sure they'll keep coming up. Um, please feel free to join us. We have uh, another question that came up earlier uh, from uh, John Hollenbeck, and uh, John asks this. Doesn't equal access to education objectify learning and make it a thing that can be transferred and rationed, as opposed to equal privileging of learning, which democratizes all knowledge? I'm going to put that back up on the stage. Yeah, I think that went up for a minute. That's, yeah, I just want to yeah. leave for a minute here. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so there's a lot of things so we, we both agree with the premise that just having access to education doesn't make things equal. But I haven't had this opportunity to think through how it objectifies learning. So uh -huh. that's an interesting idea. I'd, I'd like to hear more about it. If this person yeah. to, to yeah. be willing to talk a little bit more about it. Let me, let me just let me just draft John and haul him up on stage um, um, because I want to hear what he has to say. Hello, John, you knew this was going to happen. You knew I'd have to bring you on stage. <laughs> I didn't shower. I didn't shave this week. I was trying to stay low. <laughs> Take me as I am. Well, that's all, that's all we can do. <laughs> I, and I'm just, okay. Um, this goes to a concept that I had that went back to my graduate studies with Michael Apple. And he was talking about um, with holding education or not making things possible. And I said, well, doesn't that make you a behaviorist who thinks that knowledge is about transfer? And he said, it makes me a behaviorist only for the purposes of my theory. And I, that's when he lost me. But um, my point being, this, this isn't just a Eurocentric syllabus or class issues we've been discussing in the chat. It's, a, it's, it's the institutional norm. It is our concept of learning that we go to a, a smart person, until recently a smart white person with a beard, and we extract their knowledge from them. And we are judged on that extraction by our ability to say it back with fidelity. And, you know, this doesn't fly in most disciplines in practice. And so I guess that's what, I, what I'm saying is, um, yeah, Lisa, you don't have a beard. Look where it got you. <laughs> um, um, so, I, I mean, what it gets to me is when we're talking like this, it, it seems like behind all the theorizing and all the good intentions, we are we are placing knowledge as something that we can ration, we can control, we can pen up, keep away from some people and allow other people into. Isn't that what we're doing right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. It's, it's what we're doing because that's how the institution... My last, my last college was in New Mexico in Española. It was 85% Hispano. And what was, there were two ways to approach that school. And some tried to make everybody white, to put it bluntly. And some tried, some disciplines were free to become culturally aware of where they were. And it depended on how much flexibility they were willing to take and how much they could. But through the whole thing, you saw this whole notion was we have a thing called a unit that has a thing called knowledge behind it that has a thing we call grades uh -huh. that are all constructions of a culture that none of us can go back to. So that, that's that's my that's where I get lost in these discussions is that you know a syllabus is very much an artifact of of the old white man with the beard. Yes. And and to me, it's more interesting is how do how do we how do we let everybody manifest their own intelligence in ways that are real to them, culturally, cognitively, life-wise, everything else? That's a great question. And it really calls it, I, I really like that, rethinking what higher education looks like. Yeah. Given the pandemic and all the changes that we've had, this seems like a good opportunity to think through what we could change about the system we're in. Which includes thinking about does the syllabus serve the purpose that it used to or when it was first envisioned, right? Over the years, the syllabus has become a 20-page document, you know, in, as a way to protect yourself against everything, right? And so this is the time really to rethink about, so how else can we communicate with our students about what, how are we going to learn together? Is it a syllabus or is it going to be something else? And, should should we be really thinking about beyond the syllabus in terms of some other thing that that will that will serve the purpose of communication, but it doesn't have to be the traditional syllabus. So it, it you know 
these are questions that are coming up because of the kind of climate we are living in and uh, what you pointed out, John, um, the, uh, the, the treating treatment of education as a commercial product, right? Mm. Uh, you know, this thing, as you mentioned it. So, you know, um, even though we do talk about decolonizing the curriculum, uh, the syllabus, uh, I do, do uh, agree with you that it may be time to rethink what is the syllabus and what function does it serve and how can it be, um, how can it be better reflective of our current needs and the climate that we are living in? Right. Well, let's not kid ourselves. The syllabus is a legal document, maybe, but not really. Because as Tom pointed out earlier, students don't read the syllabus. It doesn't have the caveat that it had back in the olden days. And a syllabus, in my, my understanding, exists to convince some other school that the class you taught was close to a class that they taught because your syllabus looks like their syllabus. And that seems to be its most important function. But beyond that, then what students are looking at at a syllabus is where's the schedule? What do I have to do to get through this turkey of a class so that I get my three credits and can move on? So Interestingly, some research suggests that, I don't remember the name, that um, though we think that the syllabus doesn't play that big a role because of you know our experience with that, students do check it out. And sometimes they will not even join the class if they, they don't feel welcome based on what they read in the syllabus. So it's, you know, we continue to call it a syllabus or whatever document we want to call it, but it has to be something that that gives the student a sense of belonging, a sense that they are in, they have a place at the table and that this is an invitation to learn. Now we may end up calling it by some other term, you know, at some point I do not know, uh, but you know, currently that's, that's what we call it. And so it, um, it suggests that, you know, that uh, we need to do something about this document. How can we make it more useful, as you said, you know, other than just saying, this is what you have to do. Right, but we don't have to have this document. And that's where we get into this institutional dance where yes. all grades and classes and semesters and everything else are like this. These things that came down to us from some God who said, this is how education can ha only take place. Mm -hmm. and it's not, that's just not true. I think learning, the institution of education places learning as a solution to the professor's problems. And what engages people and what, what includes people is when learning is an answer to their problems. Mm -hmm. They learn to solve their own problems. Well, they learn to formulate their own problems. So like in my latter classes, I wanted everybody to be their own instructional designer. You know, with, within the loose framework of what this class is about, what do you need to learn? And, you know, I, my whole career has gone through different phases of where really well-intentioned, inclusive things tried to go from the top down, and they just don't work. I mean, do you remember Eubonics in San Francisco? Uh-huh. I was at state at the at, at the time when that took place, and everybody was trying really hard, but it was just not a task that could be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So you know, I I really th I think as you know we we say a lot on this forum, or at least commonly do, that we we really need to look at the practice of higher education, and I think there needs to be a, a different institution with a different mm -hmm. a whole different thing, and that's that's a, probably a whole different thing so i sh i should go mm -hmm. shave and take a shower <laughs> I, I was i was going to complain that you had too much hair um the uh, <laughs> this, is, this is this is great this is great i mean on, on we have questions that are following up on this but it, john if you want to go i'll i'll, I'll let you go um, well i can stay here if you want i mean it's, it's, well, I, we, we have one question that came up which i think all three of you would want to uh, address molly says or Molly asks in the chat, I was going to ask if there may be a need to shift to a term other than syllabus. Is there a more inclusive term to express the outline of expectations for the course throughout the semester? Learning plan. Huh. Huh. Right. Empire, State, Empire State doesn't have semesters. They don't have, they don't, they have individually, um, negotiated agreements and here's what i'm here to do and if i do all this can will you give me a master's yeah we promise we will okay let's get to work 
Okay, our learning plan. Lisa Durst suggests the course guidelines. Rita, have, have you come across in your work at the center? Have you come across any uh, um, success term? Nothing. I'm just thinking, but I really like the idea of the learning plan because it it is suggestive of it focuses the attention on the student and you know, that's what we want it should be student centered and when we say learning plan they're here to learn and the, the role of the educator of the uh, of the faculty member then becomes to help them facilitate this plan but it is they have input and it is suggestive of that it is it, it you know when i think of learning plan i'm thinking oh yes you know rather than the instructor making the learning plan for the student the student would and would work with the uh, faculty member to come up with their learning plan because they know how they learn. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, what the job of the then instructor is to help facilitate that learning process. Which is a very different project than traditional schooling. Yes. Where, where the instructor's job is to explain what they want and the student's job is to, is to give it back to them verbatim. And I see that somebody said that plan is in the learning management systems. Yes, the learning management systems have taken over to a great extent for of some of this conversation that we're talking about in terms of guidelines or um, processes that are associated as, as Tom has said, step one, step two, step three. Right. Yeah, but I would say that all that's doing is is mechanizing what was already there. Yeah. I mean, that's, there's a reason they called it Blackboard. <laughs> and we don't hand out any uh, paper copies now, <laughs> right? Everything is up online now on yeah, the system. <laughs> right, but but I, and I, I was my first online class was in 1992. Uh -huh. It was on email. Uh -huh. And what we learned in that class was when you don't have the traditional props of a classroom, learners tend to become learners and follow things that are of their interest and they end up co create. It's what I made, did my dissertation on. It democratized education simply because there were no, none of the traditional stops. Well, you know, Blackboard came along and ruined online learning. But, you know, in those, it, it showed what a student centric, democratically oriented, classrooms mm -hmm. could look like. And you see that. You, we saw that in New Mexico when we asked students what were culturally appropriate ways for them to learn, to overcome their problems, to to get where they needed to go. And, you know, it, it's just it's just different than fixing the syllabus. I, I'm sorry to keep going back to that, but it's, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's different than us saying we need to make this less white, to put it bluntly. We do, but but it shouldn't be us doing it. If, if if I could, at risk of being literally the white man with the beard, if, if I could come back to an, an earlier point in the conversation, uh, which may complement this focus uh, on a syllabus, uh, Rita, uh, you were talking briefly, I'm sorry, maybe it was Brenda, um, about how the conversation we're having now is that kind of collaborative, collective learning, you know, not an object that's being delivered. Mm -hmm one that's being constructed together. And I'm, I'm curious, in your work at Cincinnati, uh, how do you help faculty think about having that kind of pedagogy in their classrooms? Well, we go back to what our students' interests and needs are. So um, we have student listening sessions where the students will share what their concerns are in the classroom. And we bring those back to our faculty to mm. say, how can we address these concerns? So that's been mm. one thing that we found is helpful. Um, then Rita and I were also engaged in a project mm. where we very specifically asked students in our courses, what are your concerns <laughs> um, that we could address to make our classes more inclusive? Um, and we very broadly asked what their concerns are. So we were asking about like life outside of school, not just mm. in the classroom because we're very aware that higher education, if we're just talking about the syllabus, we're missing the mark. And that's not what we're trying to suggest. If you fix your syllabus, everything's gonna be great. We're suggesting the syllabus is one small step, one very small, minute part of the process. Um, this is a wicked problem as Rita wrote about <laughs> recently. It is very complex and interrelated. And if we pull at the thread on one part, Yep. Maybe we're tying the knot in a way we didn't anticipate. So yeah. being careful about how we start to undo this mm. 
problem that's important. Um, you know, so we're all familiar with syllabus, but as people have noted, you know, that's not the only place and that's not the only thing we should be looking at. Yeah, and I mean, just again, in my northern New Mexico college, we had to have a class to teach them what a syllabus was. Mm -hmm. These were mostly a first first time in college generation, so they didn't know what a syllabus sure. was. Sure. And we spent and so much time telling, telling them what it was, and, and then one of them finally, I remember one one student says, oh, so this is where you tell us what to do. Uh, yeah, that's what a syllabus is. We're here to tell you what to do. That sort yeah. of. Yeah, it's, it's easy to unravel, but difficult to wrap. So you have to be very careful as you unravel things. How uh, you also have to have a plan on how you're going to hold them back, and, and it's not always easy and not always known. So some some things are discovered in the process, as Brenda pointed out. Which, like when we when we did this project with our students, I mean, we we had focus groups, we had individual interviews, we did a survey to see what we uh, find out. You know, what what is there that we find out from our students and how we can be more inclusive. And uh, to, to uh, interestingly, we found out, though the sample size is not that big, is that a lot of students also um, indicated aspects outside school. So it was not all about you know what was happening in the classroom, but there were many aspects that contributed, uh, you know, to how they felt, and that were outside our outside school, and you know that we, as as faculty members in the classroom, could not necessarily always control. I mean, not that we can control anything much, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, John, let, let me thank you. Thank you. Um, and let me give you a break. Thank and, you. Uh, well, give, give, the, give the rest of the crowd a break. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to see you. Uh, I, I love the way that you're, that you're talking about um, these small chances or small changes uh, and how they really start to unpick and unravel the entire whole. Um, we had a comment from Bill Heinrich who says, I know learning outcomes were meant to clarify expectations, but learning, ob learning outcomes very often lock and functionally limit the range of learning that is possible in the course. Uh, so that's, that's a, a very focused one. Um, uh, friends, we, uh, that was an example of a video question. So if you'd like to join us, you, uh, you don't have to have a beard to be on stage. Um, but uh, just please uh, click the raised hand. Uh, you can tell that we're, we're very kind and supportive if you want to be up here face to face with Rita and Brenda. Uh, and if you would like to type in your question, again, the uh, Q&A box is, is there ready for you and, and for your, uh, your comments and your thoughts. Um, we've had uh, uh, one topic that's come up before when we've addressed this is a kind of future oriented view which is to say if if you have free reign to do this kind of work uh, with inclusion and DEI uh, at your university, what does it look like in, in 10 years? How is it different from 2022? Jeez, that's a dream, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, so I think we would have student-led faculty development that helps us understand what students' lives are like both in and out of the classroom um, to provide us with guidance in where we could be more supportive of their learning goals. Wow. I would see more uh, um, institutional wide support um, at all levels for 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 this work, for this for the you know for this commitment because it takes everybody's commitment at 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 their level to make this really successful. So in 10 years, I would hope that we would get to that point that there would be established commitment yeah. to this, uh, to this work, right? Yeah. But I'm gonna bring up the, the elephant we haven't talked about, mm -hmm. and that's we're in the state of Ohio, which is one of the mm -hmm. states that has pending legislation around anti-racist curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so, you know, in 10 years from now, we may not even be allowed to talk about these issues. So, <laughs> so we're right now thinking pie in the sky, doing everything we can to hold on to the ability to address diversity, equity, inclusion, recognizing that there are some who don't want us to have these conversations. Um, for the very reason I think that we were talking about with the changing in higher education, um, it was brought up in the chat, like the demographics are changing. If we're changing the way we conceive of it, some people feel threatened by that. 
And so it's how do we tread carefully forward to allow people to recognize that by valuing each person's individuality, we are not negating other ways of thinking. You know, conservative ways of thinking need to be honored and valued as well. Mm -hmm. But we um, need to respect everybody <laughs> and find ways forward where we can do that. Which is well, this is a great this is a great answer to my uh, humongous question. Uh, and you, one part I I love that uh, Verneda Hambal also agreed. Uh, uh, they wrote student led professional development. That's a great idea! Exclamation point. Um, I love the sound of that. But what but what you said was was so important that uh, on the one hand, uh, Rita, you were describing the different projects that you can that you could accomplish the different ways the institution could structure them but at the same time uh brenda you're describing the resistance outside of campus um mm -hmm. although some perhaps uh, uh on campus as well um I, what kind i mean so looking ahead i mean that seems like a very good forecast i don't mean good as in happy but good as an as an accurate and plausible uh, how, how should the academy react to these so-called anti-CRT laws that we've seen in Ohio and Florida and Texas and Ohio and Florida? Should we just amp up our lobbying of state legislatures? Or um, what do you recommend? Well, in Ohio, there are institutions of higher education have lobbied against it. Um, that particular piece of legislation, because it's too narrowly focused. Um, so I know that there's a political um, movement afoot, but I don't know how much that will have an effect. Yeah, I mean, it's time to tell. I think, um, you know, in the meantime, we may not have control over the political aspects of this, yeah. but we do have control over how we approach in our classrooms, you know, what can we do? And it goes back to that whole idea of small changes, right? We, we at our own level can still continue to do that, even as you know a lot of this happens around us. And whatever is in our control, I know some of that chat has shown that some things are not in, in our control. Sometimes we are handed things and we are just supposed to deliver them, but there are certain things that are in our control and that's where we can exercise our autonomy uh, of, of endeavoring to, or committing to, to, to these small changes. So, uh, even if it sounds like a lot of gloom, there is still hope in, in, in terms of our own personal commitment to this work and our own intentionality regarding this work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the uh, sanity uh, realism um, of, of your answers. Uh, if, if you could, well, we're waiting for more questions to come in. Uh, and friends, we're, we're down to the last 10 minutes. We're down to the wire. So this is the time to put out any question that you're just hoping to ask. Um, let, let me ask one more. This is a kind of basic question. What are some of the other like small steps that instructors can do? We've talked about re-envisioning the syllabus. We've talked about rethinking time. But we've talked about thinking about pedagogy. Uh, we talked about, you, uh, Rita, you talked earlier about uh, faculty becoming more aware of their own biases and mm -hmm. their own values. What are some other small steps that faculty can take? I think somebody has mentioned in, in, in the chat, they talked about assessment and how to uh, separate assessment from grades. I think that is a powerful uh, a way of uh, thinking about this because they're, you know, our assessment needs to be inclusive. We, we tend to, I mean, so far have been assessing uh, students on the basis of what have our Eurocentric ways, established ways, and how do we separate that? and. And how can assessment of somebody's learning be separated from grades? Because ultimately, you know, as, as again was pointed out in the, uh, in the chat, that grades then, you know, uh, continue to be a source of uh, uh, ongoing uh, challenge for some of our students, uh, especially if they're coming from underrepresented minorities, if they come first generation students. Uh, I think that is a, a, an area that, that needs uh, a lot of attention and um, where we can actually make some difference. Well, those are really good answers. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, the The chat box has been just a torrent. People have been asking. Uh, there's a chiming in on assessment, and there's more and more questions. Questions about guns in the classroom in Ohio. But I want to give uh, Bill Heinrich uh, a chance to ask one of his questions. Um, and Bill put the, from Orbis just shared this. 
In getting started in the practice of decolonizing and inclusion, does it help to use a theory to practice of inclusion, i.e. a Paulo Freire operationalized your learning plan? Um, yeah, I think for me, I um, used Asao Inouye's anti-racist writing assessment ecology book as my background because it was specific to my discipline. So I think it is helpful if you have that kind of framework, if you're thinking through what you can do to be more inclusive in your courses. Um, and I would say probably almost every discipline has uh, specific uh, work or body of knowledge that could help guide you in um, this work of making your course more inclusive. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that. I just uh, just want to make sure, is that um, uh, Asao Inouye? Yeah, uh, I-N-O-U-E. Thank you. I, I, I just put a, a link in the chat so people can... Uh, and, and people in the chat have thrown in a whole series of the recommendations. Carol Sweck's Mindset. Um, Catherine James recommends Jennifer Eberhardt's book, Biased, which has a chapter mm -hmm. on, uh, on higher ed. Uh, Bill Henrik also has a new assessment resource on equity. Um, what a good question, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I highly recommend you... Nyloa's website, Nyloa. If you're interested in equity and assessment, the work of Natasha Jen Kowalski is also really good stuff. What was the name of that website? I'm sorry. N I L O A. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we uh, just more people are asking, and 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 Tom Hames is just up on on the tear um, and uh, engaging with Maria and other people, which is great. Um, and it sounds like we have quite a few resources. Um, do you think we had a, a comment above about demographic change, not for our students, but for instructors and faculty? This is Maria. Uh, she said, I would assume for education to change in 20 years, the educator's demographics would need to change, i.e. our current diverse students may need to become professors who drive change as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, are, are, you, are you seeing more, more of this being a driver? Are you seeing more people who are not white men? Uh, obviously, I'm talking to two people who are not white men, but um, on, a, on a statistical level, are you seeing more of that change? And does that help empower the kind of transformation that you're working towards? I don't know if that's true in the demographics for professor, the professor. If I remember the latest AAUP numbers, um, women and faculty of color are still not as represented as the general population. So yes, it would help if we had more representative um, faculty of the population, but I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, it definitely does because there's so much conversation about students not having a sense of belonging if they don't see people who look like them and they're coming to these institutions, uh, you know, it's going to impact retention. But at the same time, uh, you know, as we get to, to uh, uh, bump up our efforts to make our faculty more representative of the of the students that they get in the classroom. But then again, it goes back to um, what are we doing to retain them? You know, how are we supporting them? Even if they are getting hired, how are we, how are, what are we doing to um, maintain retention? Are we providing them the support that they need? I mean, um, you find that a lot of unrepresented faculty, uh, underrepresented faculty tend to be doing larger loads of of service and uh, which goes unacknowledged because they, they're providing services to students who who are coming from underrepresented groups. So it's kind of a vicious cycle, you know. If you want to maintain, if you want to push up those numbers of underrepresented faculty, um, um, uh, underrepresented members, then you also have to have equivalent systems of support for them. To, to be able to retain them, and even if, if when you retain them, then and you know when we continue to support them, then they become um, you know uh, members of our faculty and become uh, a source of inspiration for our changing body of students. Uh, this is a serious. Well, that's that's a great and very sad answer. Um, in the in the chat a bit earlier, Tom Hames said, "If diverse students don't get through the system." 
You'll never have those diverse educators since most of them need degrees from the current systems. And that is true. So, it's, you know, if we have to, if we want to want them to be represented in our faculty bodies, we also have to make sure that they get the education to be then join academia. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, which is, which makes us, should make us think about, you know, how do we make, um, uh, students that are traditionally have not been a part of the education system, give them a sense of belonging, make them feel that they belong here, that they have mm -hmm. the same right to this education, mm -hmm. and you know, then later on become representatives in, in our faculty. So uh, there's a lot more work to be done. Are there any other ways you'd recommend for faculty to create that sense of belonging in their classes, either their virtual classes or their face-to-face -face classes? Uh, we talked before about the change in the syllabus. We talked a bit about assessment. We talked mm -hmm. about time. We talked about conversations. We talked about the work of of the two of you and and doing interviews with students to run to you know try and check on their on their issues. Is there anything else that uh, that you would ask faculty to do in order to help these students, underrepresented students, persist and maintain in these classes so that down the road some of them can become faculty? I think we always. So in addition to talking with the students who are currently in our classroom, if we could read the research that's in our field about what works to keep our students in our classes and try to employ some of those strategies. So for instance, I know that when I let my students choose their writing topics, that's something that keeps them engaged in the class so that I'm better able to retain wow. the students. So I know that works. So what? You know, and I know that from the literature in my field. So reading what research is out there in your field about what works to help with retention is something that everyone can do. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's it's I'm, I'm unsurprised as a fellow English professor to hear English professors recommend more reading. Um, that is, that's what <laughs> one of the things that we do. But this is very, very practical. Uh, you've given us a whole series of not just grand ways of thinking about education uh, and inclusion, but also very, very many practical ways of proceeding. Um, it's It's been a real treat to host the two of you, and you've been very, very generous with your time and your thinking. What is the what is the best way uh, for us to keep up with you two and your and your work? Um, if, if anybody has questions for us, um, you know, we're happy to share our email uh, with you and we're both on LinkedIn too. Feel free to contact us and we would love to continue the conversation. Um, in, in our book, we also have a section which is on Manifold. If you have resources or ideas, you can actually add to them. It's it's uh, what I call the living section of the book that you can add to uh, where there are resources available for faculty to, you know, to try in their own classrooms and also add resources or, uh, you know, uh, strategies that have worked in their own classroom. And I think by, you know, contributing to this uh, body, uh, we, we are all helping each other and we're keeping the conversation going. Well, thank you. Thank you. And again, a link to a link to uh, the book that you two authored is uh, there on the bottom left of the screen. Thank you. Thank you both. Please keep up the terrific work. Keep going. And uh, we'd love to see you again down the road. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everybody. Uh, who joined us this in conversation? Uh, we learned a lot uh, from you and your questions and the and the very very um, active chat uh, that I've been trying to follow as we've been talking to you all. Well, our pleasure, our pleasure. Thank you. But don't go away, friends. Let me just point out where we're headed over the next uh, few weeks. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues, uh, everything from the big picture of politics and institutional change down to individual classroom transformation, uh, we're on Twitter very actively. So just use the hashtag FTTE. We're on Twitter. Tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. Uh, my blog is also a place for this kind of conversation. Just go to brianalexander.org. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions on everything from teaching in general, institutional change to teaching inclusivity and supporting uh, marginalized populations just take a look at our previous sessions tinyurl.com slash ftf archive if you'd like to discuss this in other topics and see where else we're headed as we think about the future of higher ed go to forum.futureducation.us and see some of the topics we have coming up everything from the paradigm project public higher ed free speech diversity and the climate crisis 
And if you'd like to share your work on these topics or other topics, and you want me to celebrate them before the entire audience, just send me a note, brian.alexander at gmail.com, and I'd be glad to celebrate with you. And with you is the key thing. I've been delighted to be thinking about this with all of you together. Thank you for being so generous, all of you, with your opinions, your experience, your good questions, all the information you shared. Please continue to enjoy a safe summer. I hope you stay cool if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. I hope you stay warm if you're in the Southern. And above all, take care of yourself and be safe. We'll see you online next time. Bye-bye.